I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land I'm coming from, the Bunurong country of the Kulin Nation in Nam, Melbourne, and that the land here was never ceded. Okay, I'd like everybody to have their microphones off if they're not speaking, so please mute, and this session is being recorded. Um, a lot of you will be interested in our analysis of the submarines and AUKUS deal and what actions to take. We're going to have one short session in this um, band school, um, and we have a specific event planned for down the track. The agenda today is um, we have five speakers, all of whom will be speaking for six minutes and then three minutes of questions. So it's going to be a bit like speed dating. We're just going to really go pretty fast. I'll keep people to time. After the reason we want us to be so tight with time is we've got breakout rooms um, after this where you can choose to join. Um, and these will be discussion rooms for about 15 minutes. There'll be four rooms. There'll be Quit Nukes, which is about our campaign to get money out of superannuation. There'll be Pacific Solidarity, working on nuclear issues in the Pacific with Joey Tao from Suva. There'll be Education with Daryl Laconu, who's done a huge amount of work in education and academia in New South Wales. And there'll be one on political advocacy. So I'll just run down those four again. So Quit Nukes, getting money out of nuclear weapons, Pacific Solidarity, Education, and political advocacy. So whilst you're listening to the uh, speakers, um, please think about which, which breakout room you would like to join, because I think we'll have some really in interesting discussions in all of them. Um, this band school session is part of the Raising Peace uh, Festival. So a special hello to all you Raising Peace Festival goers. Um, this is the fifth of the ICANN band schools. And it's really been um, tremendous to see how many people have come. We've had guests from Boston, Suva, Fiji, Marshall Islands, Colorado, Christchurch, and across Australia. And of course, the next step is action. Um, so I think without much further ado, um, I'll begin. Um, our first speaker is Tillman Ruff. Tillman is very well known to probably almost everyone on the on this video, but I'll introduce him all the same. He's a public health and infectious diseases physician, an associate professor at the University of Melbourne, worked for many years as international medical advisor for the Red Cross, and is co-president currently of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, who had a Nobel Peace Prize in 1985. And he is the founding chair, or was the founding chair and Australian yeah. chair of ICANN. So Tillman, if you'd like to start us off. Articles mostly as assessment or two. And if sure. Thank, mute. Thanks very much, Margie, uh, for that uh, kind introduction. This is obviously a big hot topic and I'll, I can only cover it very briefly. Um, and just to foreshadow, as Margie said, that we will arrange a, a longer discussion about this really profound um, decision and what it means. Um, there's a number of, of things to say. I think um, perhaps just a couple of sort of factual things just to clarify what we're talking about. We're talking about nuclear armed submarines, sorry, nuclear powered submarines, not nuclear armed submarines. There are currently six nations that have nuclear powered submarines. All of them have nuclear weapons and those submarines were specifically developed um, to, de to deploy nuclear weapons on. Um, so from that point of view, it's a, it's a major step. Um, the UK and US uh, nuclear powered submarines um, and some of the others, but those two relevant in this context, run on directly weapons usable, weapons grade, highly enriched uranium, 93% uranium-235. It was specifically produced for use in nuclear weapons. So it's directly usable bomb fuel. So there's a, that adds a very significant sort of proliferation to mention to this. Um, the UK and US um, uh, uh, have a very long, the US has a long range plan to shift to low enriched uranium, but it's likely to be well into the 2040s before that ever happened. They've been dragging their heels on that. So it's quite likely that Australian submarines built over the next 20 years would also run on highly enriched uranium. 
there would be at least uh, 20 nuclear weapons worth of highly enriched uranium on each of these submarines, and it would need to be taken out of the safeguards obligations that Australia is under under the Non-Proliferation Treaty for those whole 30 plus years uh, that it would be deployed um, in the submarines. Um, that's a loophole that the Non-Proliferation Treaty allows, but that no nation has ever uh, driven a truck through um, quite as uh, flagrantly as this would, um, in, um, as this would reflect. Um, I think there are a number of concerns with it, even though it's not directly, um, you know, committing Australia in relation to nuclear weapons. Um, because it certainly will increase the pressure uh, and shorten substantially the path um, towards acquisition of either domestic nuclear power or more particularly Australian nuclear weapons. And the other area that it could particularly impinge on us in relation to nuclear weapons is that because these will be built essentially to US or UK specifications, um, submarines which were designed to deliver nuclear armed missiles. And because part of the announcement included that the package would include Tomahawk cruise missiles, US missiles for these submarines, Tomahawk cruise missiles can have either a conventional warhead or a nuclear one. Uh, and so if they're capable of launching con conventionally armed Tomahawk missiles, they're presumably capable of launching nuclear ones. This package also involves a whole bunch of other uh, aspects that the government has not fleshed out, but, but foreshadowed. Uh, a threefold increase in the Marines on rotation in Darwin, cooperation on artificial intelligence and cyber offensive capabilities, other missile cooperation, uh, potentially increased logistical support and potentially basing of US forces in Australia, um, all of which would increase the concern that this uh, might involve possible deployment of US nuclear armed platforms in Australia or potentially even storage of US more likely than UK nuclear weapons in Australia, in which case there's also a question about whether these submarines could be used um, to deliver uh, US or UK nuclear weapons, if not Australian ones, as the US already has arrangements with five NATO member states, Germany, Turkey, Italy, Belgium, and the Netherlands to share um, aircraft carried uh, nuclear bombs, B-61 bombs. Um, so there are a number of, of sort of nuclear dimensions to this. And, and the fact that uh, these submarines are clearly intended for close interoperability uh, to operate at considerable distance from Australia to be essentially involved in, in, in an escalating arms race, um, confrontation, and essentially a new Cold War, I think it's not too exaggerated to say, with China. Uh, they do um, escalate uh, the risks of armed conflict in, in North and East Asia. Um, in a way that could well turn nuclear. So uh, they have a bunch of, of really profound um, implications for Australia. The most obvious minute, way yep, in which one Australia minute. could make it clear uh, and really walk the talk, you do not want to trust any prime minister's simple word on a matter of such moment and, and of enduring implications that will outlive likely his lifetime, not just his prime ministership. Um, the most effective way Australia could actually make it really clear and provide surety that this is not about um, delivering or acquiring nuclear weapons capacity would be to join the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, but yeah, I think for, for lots of reasons in terms of um, this being a, a huge long range decision that got no public or parliamentary discussion, no real consideration of, of, of the options, at the tail end of the third term of a troubled government, almost on the cusp of the pre-election caretaker period, um, smacks of, of political opportunism and, and, and machinations. Um, each of these submarines poses a significant accident and terrorist risk. There are currently eight nuclear powered submarines that lie on the bottom of the ocean, all by one with their nuclear weapons 
and all of them with their crew members down there as well. Um, so there are multiple other issues, uh, but th th that's um, probably enough to get you started. <laughs> I think so, sadly. Thank you very much, Tillman. That's great. Um, so we have literally three minutes and I'm putting my timer on for it for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please put your hand up in the chat because that way I can see you. Um, and please keep your questions quite brief. So put your hand up in the chat if you'd like to ask a question. Okay, Frank Hutchinson. You're, you're muted, Frank. Uh, thank you for outlining the very serious implications of this uh, latest decision around nuclear submarines. One of the issues that concerns me is the way in which the issues are being framed, a kind of China panic, and at the same time, the possibility of an excuse being used or, alibi, or an alibi being used to militarise, to further militarise things. And I'm, I'm worried particularly, and I'd ask your thoughts about this in terms of North Asia, what do you see as the potential bump on effects if Australia goes ahead with this for countries like Japan and South Korea? Would they want to go down a similar pathway and acquire nuclear subs? And what would be the consequences of that for the future of peace in our area? Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Yes, I think this is likely to cause um, concern, tension and escalate militarization of our region in, in a number of respects. But certainly one of them is that, um, you know, as I, in a sense, the, the, uh, the first example of this of a non-nuclear weapon state in the MPT language acquiring nuclear powered submarines, Brazil has a substantially advanced indigenous uh, nuclear powered submarine development program. Um, Iran has talked uh, about such a program. South Korea and Japan uh, have substantial technical, uh, including submarine capability and may well uh, want to head in the same direction. Yes, I think that escalatory potential um, that uh, you know, would, would dramatically increase militarization, you know, Cold War style arms racing and, and military confrontation in, in North Asia and in the South China Sea, of course, as, as well, um, I think is a major concern. I mean, there are, there are not too many scenarios that you can imagine for a war starting with, with China um, that involves, you know, other nuclear armed states that doesn't escalate to nuclear use fairly, fairly rapidly. Thank you, Tillman. That, in fact, neatly fills our three minutes. As I said, it's speedy today. Um, I'd like now to really introduce Margaret Perrell, who's a fabulous woman I've worked with a lot on quick nukes. She volunteered with ICANN and MAPW. She's been incredibly generous with her time and expertise. Um, she's, sorry. <laughs> um, she's a retired academic company director and finance executive who's worked in a number of senior roles. So Margaret, take it away, please. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for your kind words. I have six minutes, so I will make six points. The first one is what is Quit Nukes? Quit Nukes is a campaign to stop super funds from investing in nuclear weapons. If you want to know more, go on our website, quitnukes.org. You will have the history, you will have our briefing paper, you will have the list of organizations that have joined our honor rolls. So I won't waste time with the facts, go to the website. The next five points relate to why should super funds stop investing in nuclear weapons companies? So we want them to stop, so why? What I've done is look at this from various perspective and there's five perspective, ICANN's perspective, society, um, environment, the members, and the superannuation funds themselves. Okay, so it's very simple for you to remember this, just five points. From ICANN's perspective, the idea is that this will contribute to the denormalization process. We want, quit, we want nuclear weapons to disappear everywhere, so we want to, them to disappear from the finance sector as well. 
and that eventually that denominizes uh, nuclear weapons. From the society's perspective, the use of nuclear weapons breach every humanitarian principle that currently exists. And they are controversial weapons. And from environmental perspective, nuclear weapons pollute the environment. They have an impact on climate. And I'm sure you're aware of all of this. From the members' perspective, I'm already on point number five, so I'm going really quickly here. From the members' perspective, Quit Nukes has carried out a survey, and we know that most Australians do not want their money going into superannuation funds. So the members don't want their money going there. So that is a bloody good reason why it shouldn't be there. Excuse my language. And the last one is the big one, is from the superannuation, fund, superannuation perspective. Now, we know that superannuation funds or their trustees have a duty to act in the best financial interest of their members. Best financial interest comes with proper risk management. In short, superannuation funds aim to have lower risks in their portfolio and generate higher returns. So we argue that nuclear weapons investments in a portfolio actually increases the risk of the portfolio. And we have identified at least 10 risks that is being carried by superannuation funds. I'll just go through them very quickly. The first one is a reputational risk. I mean, members don't want their money going in, super, in nuclear weapons. So if a fund is putting money in, super, in nuclear weapons companies, well, that really is not very good for their reputation. We have been liaising with the Responsible Investment Association of Australia, and they have finally woken up to the fact that nuclear weapon is actually a controversial weapon and they will change their definition from next year, and that's a really big win. So to date, super funds have not thought of nuclear weapons as the controversial weapons. And the main reason for that is that Australia hasn't, there hasn't been a treaty to ban nuclear weapons. We now have a treaty and over what, 55 countries are party to it. And we do expect Australia to be party to that treaty down the track. We have Labour who's already pledged to, to be part of that treaty. We have 38 local government um, councils who are trying to persuade the government to sign the treaty. And they are now going to start pressuring superannuation funds to um, divest of those weapons. And so in a way, it's really good that we might have sort of local councils really putting pressure on the super funds. And of course, the treaty is now in force. Um, and the other thing is that we expect more regulation, as ICANN knows very well, this is not the only treaty that it will be in place. There'll be further treaties and further regulations down the track. So in short, I've, I've cut this really brief, there are a number of reasons where it's pointing to the direction where nuclear weapons will almost become obsolete assets in That's super funds. Minute, yeah, just like coal or fossil fuels or tobacco. And gradually, a lot of super funds have already divested of those other sort of nasties. So we expect gradually that to happen. And if superannuation expect that, they're better off to be doing it now rather than later. And I'm done. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> so now we have some questions. So please, if you have questions for Margaret, please pop, pop your hand up and then I can see you so that I can invite you to ask the question. The, the hand up is, if you want to put your hand up, on the bottom right hand of your screen, there's a little smiley face saying reactions, and the hands up there is, that's where the hands up function is. Okay, Margie, your first came off the rank, please. Yeah, the, um, if, if, you, if you split superannuation into um, three groups, um, 
easy, medium and hard, who's in the easy, who's a few, two or three or four in the easy group? Um, they can't be split into easy, medium and hard. Mm -hmm. um, we have started dealing with um, the in industry funds and perhaps that might fall into easy, but the easy is still very hard. Um, perhaps the easiest one also are the, the religious funds, like we have Crescent Wealth Superannuation Fund and Christian Super Fund, because these religious funds already operate on a sort of, could we say, an ethical basis. So most of, a lot of them are already nuclear weapons free. So that they may be the easiest ones. The hardest one would be the public se sector funds probably, in other words, the government ones, because they religiously ad adhere to, to legislation that is passed by Australia. So if Australia has, um, is a party to a particular treaty, then those public sector funds are likely to abide by that. So for cluster munitions, for example, the public sector funds don't invest in cluster munitions. Because Australia is not yet a party to the DPNW, they simply will just ignore nuclear weapons. Thanks, Margaret. Um, Rose. Thanks. I was actually going to ask a sort of similar question about um, industry versus um, private funds. but. Uh, I was also wondering about the ethical funds and how are they faring, um, even uh, ethical um, sections of larger. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> yes, we have Australian Ethical, which is an ethical superannuation fund and investment, and they are on a, on a roll, they are nuclear weapons free. So their whole, all of their portfolios are nuclear free. With the, a lot of the super funds, they do have, as you say, one ethical option or sustainable option, socially aware option. It comes with various names. We have found that some of the funds, for example, UD Super's ethical option is nuclear weapons free, but Australian Super's ethical option is not nuclear weapons free. And the reason for that is uh, mainly because they, they don't consider, they have not considered nuclear weapons as a controversial weapon. So generally ethical funds will not invest in land mines and cluster munitions uh, because Australia is already a party to these two treaty uh, conventions. But some of them are, I would say that they probably simply are not aware or have not been aware of the TBNW entering into force. Thank you both. I'm going to keep rolling <coughs> on. Um, our next guest is Joey Tao, who has a really extensive background in media and communications. Um, he's worked in mainstream media projects across Papua New Guinea and the Pacific, and currently he's based in Suva. He has an interest in communications for development in the Pacific and his media and campaigns officer with the Pacific Network on Globalization. That's called PANG. PANG is the region's alternative voice in defending and promoting Pacific people's right to economic self-determination, mobilizing, advocating, and challenging the neoliberal development agendas in the Pacific. Joey is also part of the regional movement, Young Solowara Pacific, a regional movement comprised of a collective of activists from the Pacific who share common concerns on the issues impacting the Pacific. And as everyone here would know, the Pacific has a tragic history of being way too much involved in nuclear issues. So thanks, Joey, for being here today. Thank you very much, Margie. And Bulavinaka, warm Pacific greetings to everyone. Just want to thank uh, Jem and ICANN Australia for this opportunity to present um, on the Pacific solidarity um, at the school ban. Band school, sorry. Um, just very quickly, if you could all see my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, can see it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll quickly go through um, the legacy of nuclear testing in the Pacific, uh, but also just speak to the current trends and movements of solidarity that are happening 
um, amongst young people and young people's movements. So very quickly, with given the time, um, just wanted to brush on very quickly. I'm sure most of you are, uh, are very aware of the nuclear testing legacy in the Pacific. But just like what we are presented with Australia and its current proposal of uh, its submarines, um, powered submarines rather for uh, security and ge uh, geopolitic geopolitical reasons, just like nuclear testing in the Pacific, it was proposed as the common good for all mankind. And using those such narratives that um, testings were done within the region. Um, in between 1946 and 1958, it was proposed as the Pacific Proving Ground, and that was mostly done uh, in the Marshall Islands by the US. Uh, in Britain also conducted nuclear testings in Montebello Island. Uh, in Australia, between 1952 to 1957. And under Operation Grapple, the British government conducted uh, atomic hydrogen bomb test in Kiritimati uh, in Kiribati, which also involved naval officers from Fiji, uh, New Zealand, and Britain. Uh, very quickly, between 1966 and to 1996, France conducted 193 uh, atmospheric underground tests in Mororua and Fangatafo, atolls in French Polynesia or uh, Mahuinui. Um, but while tests have ended in the Pacific, our Pacific people continue to live with the environmental impacts. Uh, the health of our Pacific people continue to suffer uh, and there are ongoing movements for uh, rehabilitation. During these tests, uh, there were strong uh, movements in the Pacific, which triggered um, movements in, in rather here in Fiji and throughout the Pacific, including Australia and New, New Zealand. Uh, resistance groups intensified in the 1970s uh, from mostly churches, trade union, university students, the feminist groups, uh, cultural leaders who actively uh, opposed the testing within the Pacific and had mostly had demonstrations uh, at French embassies throughout uh, the Pacific or um, at, at French missions that uh, were throughout the Pacific. Uh, again, there were also the formation of groups such as ATOM, the Against Testing in Mororua, uh, the Fiji anti-nuclear group called FANG back in the days in the 70s, and of course, the popular nuclear free and independent Pacific where uh, some of the active groups that are calling for nuclear justice. Uh, NFIP movement was one that really pushed for um, also the anti-nuclear uh, movements in the Pacific, but also pushed for some of the uh, independence movements uh, back then in the Pacific with regards to some of the territories such as um, Mahui Nui and uh, New Caledonia, Kanaki. But bring us fast forward now, uh, since tw the 20 2010, there's a new breed of uh, young Pacific people uh, rising up, continuing the legacy of uh, the NFIP movement uh, and are calling for nuclear waste, not nuclear waste. A movement such as Young Solar Pacific, which one I am part of, I also see Tale, who is also here. Uh, Wayne, who is part of the Marshall Island Students Association, um, are continuing this nuclear uh, activism uh, in the region and also in uh, reviving um, student activism at uh, universities. So one such has been the University of the South Pacific where you have the Marshall Island students who are quite active um, in other parts of the region. Uh, very quickly, this are uh, just some in, in picture, Young Soros calls for the TPNW lobbying with Pacific states, uh, trying to ensure that our Pacific Island countries sign up, uh, lobbying directly with our states, but also um, responding to the current um, proposal by Japan to dispose um, nuclear waste into the Pacific Ocean. So these are just some of the issues that young Solara, these young people, Marshall Island Students Association in the Pacific um, have been standing up, but it's also just sharing some of what, um, carrying on the legacy of what the NFIP movement have left on and reviving student activism at institutions. you have one minute. 
Uh, just before I go, uh, this is why we, we, we continue the legacy. Uh, it's a re reminder of young people, the next generation, our kids. There's a photo of Mai Mai, who is a Marshallese young girl. It is for their future and our unborn children's future that we continue uh, the legacy against uh, nuclear testing, nuclear injustice, calling for nuclear waste, not nuclear waste. Yanaka. Thank you, that's fantastic. Um, of all people who know the legacies of nuclear weapons, the Pacific has certainly suffered enough. So thank you very much for that, Joey. Um, again, if you have a question, just please put your hand up. Um, and then I can see you, I, unfortunately, because it's, so, it's lovely to have so many people attending, but unless you put your hand up, I can't actually see you. So use the reaction button in the chat. Well, Joey, you've blown everybody out of the water. Oh no, Peter, please go ahead. Thanks, Margie. Uh, Joey, thanks very much for that. I just wonder if you could talk about any uh, perceptions you have of a, uh, like an arms race or a militarization a race in the South Pacific or the Pacific Island nations. Uh, is it respond? Uh, sorry, is it in regards to the recent announcement by Australia in regards to the current agreement it has with US and the UK or? I think with my perception from Sydney is it's been going on for a while because of the China and the Pacific step up by Australia and so on. But but this latest thing, yeah, it's, it's adding to it, I think. I was expecting not to comment, but I would comment on that. Um, I think for the Pacific, our current issues are not um, nuclear powered submarines. The current issues for the Pacific are climate change. Uh, deep sea mining, uh, the, the, the recovery to, of COVID. These are the pressing issues for the Pacific and as Australia as a so-called big brother in the region that leads Pacific regionalism, uh, if it means stepping up into the region or stepping up in the region in terms of Pacific diplomacy, I think our priorities are clear. Climate change, we're at the forefront of this issue. Um, nuclear legacy, uh, unsettled nuclear legacy that um, um, have not been addressed. And uh, Australia is a party to the uh, nuclear free Pacific, a uh, nuclear free zone in the Pacific. So as, as a party to that, new Australia needs to stand up, um, you know, commit to the, the treaty that it had um, signed in, um, in Rarotonga, but also commit to the TPNR. Thanks, Joey. That's terrific. We've got time for one more quick question. Okay, Daryl, thank you. Yeah, hi, Joey. I just wonder, um, are there any other university or student organisations elsewhere that, that, that uh, you connect with from Fiji and the Marshall Islands? Are there any other groups that you know about in the Pacific or beyond that? I'm thinking of university student groups. Uh, yeah, we have the University uh, of Papua New Guinea. Uh, we have uh, some of uh, Victoria University in Wellington uh, working with diaspora communities. So it's just not academia and students. Yeah. I think we need a diverse group of young people um, on the issue. Yeah. Great. Okay, thank you. That's that's right to time. So thank you. I understand Philip had his hand up, but it needs to be in the chat using the hand in the chat because otherwise I can't the reactions button. Otherwise, I don't see you. So we, we'll keep moving on. And, and Philip, if you've got questions, by all means, join Joey in the breakout room because I'm sure there'll be some really good discussion there. So now I'd like to invite Daryl Lacornia, who like Tillman is with me on the board of ICANN and is an incredibly does incredible amount of work like Tillman. Um, Daryl's a lecturer, curriculum consultant, and textbook writer. He's got many years of experience designing curriculum and teaching for history and legal studies in many schools. He's currently co-vice president of the New South Wales Division of the United Nations Association of Australia and a member of the Academic Council of the United Nations. So Daryl, thank you for speaking today. 
Thanks, Margie. And I just realised we need to update that a little bit because I'm not co-vice president of the UNAA, so I'll do that later. Okay, uh, it's great to see you all. I'm going to go to screen share and just go through a couple of slides. So. All right, so we're talking about education here, and uh, ICANN does a fantastic job of education. I mean, that's that's the reason that ICANN's achieved what they have. Uh, but what we're talking about here is a broader education that, uh, that should be happening regardless of, of what ICANN is doing. There's just simply a lack of knowledge about, uh, lack of general knowledge about the Cold War nuclear weapons or any of the history uh, except from perhaps this group of people. Most of you are going to have a fairly good general knowledge of all this, but the general population doesn't. And the young teachers that I work with in schools and, and uh, teaching at university, they don't have much, not much knowledge of this. So they've got to learn it from scratch. Uh, one good place to start when looking at education is just looking at what the UN says. And this really good 100-page uh, booklet by Peace Boat on their education approach to education is great for outlining the UN uh, uh, approach to disarmament education. And also looking at the treaty document itself, education is very much a part of that, recognizing the importance of peace and disarmament education, sort of a broader education, raising awareness of risks and consequences of nuclear weapons, and also teaching about the treaty itself. So that's in the treaty. The treaty says we should be spending, uh, some of our focus should be on education. Now, most students know about climate change. They've either, either learned it at school through their science teachers or geography teachers, probably not their history teachers, unfortunately. Um, and the, and they, they know it. And it's also in the community. There's much more community awareness about climate change but that doesn't exist with nuclear weapons. There's just an absence of knowledge and general knowledge about that. So how can we support ICANN by, by pushing this, pushing for more education in this area? I think the first thing is to realize the different aspects of education uh, outlined there. There are the different aspects in the school system and on the right-hand side of the university system. There's lots of different aspects of it. One example is curriculum, syllabus is in schools, teach units, they're already there, they're happening. For this particular one in New South Wales, probably 2000 students are doing this right now, going to do their HSC exam in this 30 hour course. Uh, there's great websites, uh, one that's going to be launched in a few weeks time from the UK, it's got all of this stuff on nuclear testing. It's for nine to 16 year olds, so it's a great resource. C and D education in the UK is also really good. Of course, we have the student uh, organization mentioned here. Well, where are the others? You know, uh, do we know about others that we can link to? Talks to students are great opportunities. Using the medal has been good uh, to, to get into schools and universities. Pre-service teachers, it's important to teach them about this. So they go into schools and they teach about it. And there's actual courses at university where they have a, a nuclear weapons component. And lastly, social justice groups, students in school keen to do things like uh, on human rights or nuclear weapons or other things. Now, the question is, and this is where we finish, how can we promote nuclear knowledge and knowledge about the, the treaty in education in this more general way? So how can we share ideas, resources, etc. experience. How can we support each other? So how can we link with the student um, associations in, in Fiji and the Marshall Islands? How can we link them with ones at Macquarie University or Western Sydney University? How can we support, support each other? If someone's got a great resource or great idea, support other groups with that. Link classrooms across the Pacific and Australia. And lastly, how can we network? So all of those people who are interested in education, whether you're a parent, teacher, student, university, whatever, how can we network together, share ideas and support each other? So I might finish there.
Oh, good on you, Daryl. That's easy. Makes my job easy. Right. You're, you're two before minutes goal, short. Yeah, the before the, you won. You won. Yeah. yeah. Right. Terrific. So once again, please um, pop your hand up using the reaction button because that way I can see you. Um, that was terrific. So thank you. That's some really excellent talks. So who would like to ask Daryl a question? Okay, hey, you're like, oh, here we are, Maggie, over to you. Yeah, I've got a, a question, something about the relationship with the STEM and the, um, the weapons in school and whether you're thinking about that, that's sort of the negative side of it and um, what your relationship with MAPW is around that. Um, yeah, look, I'm not really an expert on that. Um, all I can say, and I'm speaking New South Wales, so in New South Wales, nuclear weapons are taught in a number of subjects in legal studies, modern history, to an extent in geography, there's a possibility and so on. So I just know there are areas where they are taught in the humanities, uh, not so much the sciences as far, far, far as I'm aware. That's about it, just the humanities and English. I do a bit of uh, stuff in extension English on, there's a unit called After the Bomb, which is looking at all dystopian uh, literature and films on what happens after a nuclear war. So I can't comment any more than that. Um, I might add a little bit with my MAPW hat. Um, I was at a meeting, I'm not directly involved with the STEM work, but um, Jenny Grounds wrote to the Victorian Education Department and pointed out that having weapons companies in schools was directly contrary to their policies. And um, the education department wrote back and said, yes, you're right, we'll do something about this. So we were all thrilled. I mean, it comes on the background of a huge amount of work that's been mm -hmm. done looking into how much weapons companies are intruding into secondary and even primary education, which is pretty shocking. Mm. Um, and there's been an excellent report called Missiles and Miners, I think, by MAPW. If you look at the MAPW website, mapw.org.au, you can find that. Um, Margaret, did you have a question? You're on mute, Margaret. Thank you, Daryl. Hello, everyone. Um, I was wondering, Daryl, if you know, with the revision of the national curriculum that's going on at the moment, is there any, do you know if there's anything happening there? I mean, school students taught, for example, that we got the, the Nobel Peace Prize in Australia. Oh, of course not. Uh, yeah, thanks, Margaret. No, they're not. Um, and yeah, I've been involved in, in looking at the national curriculum and so on. But the national curriculum is a little bit like the, the response to the pandemic. The federal government uh, likes to make you think that they're in control and everything like that. But really, it's the states that run the show. It's how it's implemented in the states. And it's a very limited document, the national curriculum document. The states do their own thing. Some states are have already have strong things on nuclear weapons and, and others don't. So I don't think the national curriculum itself is going to influence things much because the states are still doing stuff. They've already acted. Uh, but educators like myself will try hard to lobby uh, our own state authorities to try and get nuclear weapons in the curriculum and so on to a great extent. Thanks, Daryl. That's great. We're running beautifully to time. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Jem Ronald. Jem is the Australian Director for ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Um, she's working with all of us to build pressure and awareness for Australia to sign and ratify the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. She's been a nuclear-free campaigner for a decade, and we regard ourselves incredibly fortunate to have her working with us at ICANN. Um, and she's also had six years experience producing radio. She has degrees in communication and law from the University of Technology in Sydney. So take it away, Jim. Thanks, Maggie. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, intimidated by how well everyone has kept to time. <laughs> but hopefully I don't <laughs> blow things out. So can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay, cool. Well, I better be brief then. I just wanted to recap in case there are some new people who aren't as familiar, although, you know, you're all part of band school, so presumably all our students have 
will be graduating with flying colours in um, the treaty and ICANN activism as of tonight. Congratulations. Um, so the treaty was negotiated, opened for signature in 2017. It puts nuclear weapons on the same legal footing as chemical and biological weapons, landmines and cluster munitions, all of which have been banned. It's a categorical, categorical rejection of all things nuclear weapons, including possession, hosting, development, use and threat of use. Certainly, if these submarines were to be nuclear capable, that would not be permitted. Um, it's also illegal to assist or encourage a nation to engage in any of the prohibited activities. So we know the treaty won't eliminate nuclear weapons in one fell swoop or in the short term even, but it will provide, you know, it provides a tool to further stigmatize and increase global pressure on the nuclear armed and all of their accomplices like Australia. So it has already shifted the goalposts and the nuclear armed states are more on the defensive and they're trying to shut the treaty down, which tells us that we're on the right track. And we also know that a prohibition is a vital step on the path to elimination. Uh, some special parts of the treaty, it acknowledges the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons activities on indigenous people worldwide, acknowledges the disproportionate impact of radiation on women and girls, um, currently, there are 86 signatories in 55 states parties, and that, uh, that number will increase month by month. Um, the first meeting of states parties to the treaty will be in March next year. And one of our demands is that Australia, um, besides signing and ratifying the treaty, engages with it and, and goes to that uh, first meeting of states parties. It will be at the UN in Vienna. <clears throat> this is a picture of... Um, uh, Yankin Jada Anangu woman Karina Lester presenting the Indigenous statement to the negotiating conference and that was on behalf of 35 First Nations organisations around the world in 2017. So you know Australia's position is atrocious here. Here we are in 2021 with a government that is welding itself to weapons of mass destruction. We boycotted the negotiations, we support this policy of nuclear deterrence, oppose the treaty, and the US has instructed all its allies. Um, I'm finding Gem's frozen. Is anyone else having trouble with her frozen? Yeah, she just suddenly froze. No, yeah, Gem, you might want to turn your screen off and perhaps just speak. We can't hear you anymore. So I think your internet might be a bit unstable. So if maybe you can turn your screen off and just ad lib from the slides for a bit, that would be good. Um, okay, sounds like she's um, been lost her internet connection. I might ad lib for a little bit. Um, Australia, we're currently working, oh, is she back? Is that Jim, are you back? Can't see her, looks like we might've lost her altogether. It's a pity because she's the um, technolo technology whiz that's going to put us on to breakout rooms. So we could have a much bigger, bigger breakout room altogether. Solidarity in breakout rooms. Um, okay, so basically in Australia, we've been working really hard, as many of you would know, talking to politicians. It's getting increasingly difficult to get access at all to um, coalition politicians, although we do have a cross-party group um, of parliamentary friends that meet a couple of times a year. Um, I've just got a message that we can still have breakout rooms, so that's good. Thank you very much, Fergus. I'm back. You're back. Well done. Take it away, Jim. I was just laughing. So sorry, the internet on. dropped out. <laughs> so I don't know how many minutes I have left, but let's keep Let's go for it at this point, Jim. <laughs> uh, okay, wait. No, I just wanted to go back to joining the ban. Um, you know, this is consistent with most of the ban treaty is consistent with treaties that we have already joined. Um, there are a couple of things that have to change, a couple of things that, um, that can change. Uh, and it's also consistent with the fact that we've joined all the other treaties that prohibit inhumane weapons. So to join the treaty and be in compliance with it, we need to stop saying that we're protected by nuclear weapons because that's, you know, that's legitimizing them and that's illegal under the treaty. We're not served by this kind of policy and we should discontinue lending validation to this dangerous concept of, of nuclear deterrence. So we can have a military alliance with the US. Um, the treaty was drafted to permit this as long as we are not 
cooperating on the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons or assisting the US to engage in any of the activities prohibited under the treaty. We have signed other treaties when the US hasn't and when they've been very much push, uh, pushing Australia not to, and we will have to do the same again. Sometimes you have to disagree with your ally. Um, friends don't let friends have weapons of mass destruction. Well, they shouldn't anyway. So just a quick, you know, support status update. We do have hundreds of parliamentarians at the state, territory and federal level who have uh, signed on the dotted line, signed the pledge saying that they support the treaty and they'll work for Australia to, to ratify it. That includes 89 in the federal parliament and that's all of the Greens, three quarters of Labor, the Centre Alliance, uh, several independents and a few coalition members as well, not many. There is, I think, as Margie was mentioning, the parliamentary friends of the treaty uh, cross-party group. And there are 23 members of that. And of course, we have the Labor commitment to sign and ratify in government, and they've held that policy since 2018. So a really important part of our work is to hold the line on that and ensure that there's policy follow through, um, you know, if and when they do form government, but also to grow the level of support and pressure on the coalition in the meantime and to get them to do it, you know, they should do it. So who else is behind the band? Well, all of you, um, and all of you probably fit into some of these groups as well. Um, so 79% of the public polling shows that this is not controversial. Uh, this is something that uh, we want the, the government to sign up to. As Margaret Perrell mentioned, councils are 38 currently. Um, there'll be a, a motion at Ballarat on um, Wednesday night, shout out to Madonna in the crowd. Uh, the Australian Local Government Association passed a motion at their conference in the middle of the year calling on Australia to join the treaty. So that, that's the body that represents all 537 councils, the Red Cross, medical organisations, faith-based organisations, unions, our partner organisations. And what are we asking you to do? Well, I mean, it's, it's pre-election time. We've got a lot to talk about. We need to we need to expand the the group of people talking to parliamentarians um, you know beyond all of us it needs to to get bigger um, so you know we have a big mission but our, our goal of getting australia on side this treaty is really achievable and it will be um, very impactful for other nations who are in similar positions um, who want to join the treaty so we're really purposefully growing a cohort of people who despise nuclear weapons and, and want to do more about it, more than reading emails. And they're picking this issue up and raising it with um, their council or their federal or their state or territory MPs. So anyone can do this, solo or in pairs or groups, and you really don't need to be an expert. We've got lots of resources we can share with you. Um, and, you know, why do this? We, you know, we're asking people to, to get in touch and then, you know, form a, form a dialogue, form a relationship with your with your parliamentarian and, and be in touch with them semi-regularly um, when you know there are updates on the treaty or, or different things to ask them to do. Why? Well, we can't talk to all of them and some of them won't open their doors to us, but they will open their doors to you. So that's um, you know partly why we're asking for your help because this will amplify our impact. So it's not a big time undertaking, but it will make a big difference. So I have heard that one meeting is worth at least a thousand petition signatures. <laughs> uh, so this image here is of um, Sam Drummond from Lawyers for Peace, who met with Peter Khalil, um, Labor MP in Wills a few weeks ago on Zoom. So even through a pandemic, we can do this and that could be you. All right, I'm stopping there. Thanks. Everybody. Well done, Jim. <laughs> um, we've got a, a, a minute or so for, I was given very strict instructions I had to run to time, so I'm being, being good. Um, about a minute for a quick question. Anyone got a quick question for Jim? Okay, while you're thinking about questions, I'll just do a little bit of housekeeping about the breakout rooms. There's going to be four breakout rooms. Um, one is Quit Nukes, one is Pacific Solidarity, one is Education, and one is Political Advocacy. Um, so Quit Nukes, Pacific Solidarity, Education, and Political Advocacy. We'd like um, one person to report back. You'll have 15 minutes for discussion. And what we'd like you to talk about is sort of if there are any actions or outcomes recorded uh, or the gist of the conversation. When you get into the rooms, if one of the first things you can do 
is um, try and decide one person who's happy to, to be the representative for the group at the end of the, the 15 minutes. So you'll be able to choose a group. I'll run through the names of the groups again. So it's Quit Nukes, Pacific Solidarity, Education or Political Advocacy. So I'm going to see you all in about 15 minutes. Um, you can choose your groups. I'm not quite sure how this works, but Jem has, Jem has got it all under control. So I'm now handing back to Jem for the tech side. Thank you. Okay, well, that was, I don't know what it was like in the other three rooms, but we were getting right into it. <laughs> it wasn't long enough. Um, thank you, everyone. That was a really um, excellent discussion in the room we were in, and I'm sure there's been very interesting discussions in the other rooms. Um, I'm just looking to see how many people are coming back. We may have lost a few people who couldn't stay for more than an hour. So I might start by um, getting uh, the spokesperson for the uh, Quit Nukes room to, to speak. If there's someone who is prepared to take notes or speak what was happening, speak to what Hi, was Margie. happening. Hi, Margie. It's me, Rose. <laughs> Go, Rose. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, look, we barely touched the surface because um, we felt like we just needed a little bit more background. Um, but there's inspiration from, I guess, the campaign that started around tobacco, um, initiated by an Australian woman. Um, and they're all the work that's going on in terms of divestment from fossil fuels in the climate space. So I guess there's, um, you know, lessons to be learned and uh, from from those areas. And we certainly felt that, yes, there's both a lack of knowledge from the point of view of people who put their money in superannuation and either don't know or don't care uh, what actually happens. And the difficulty of actually, um, as um, was being explained, that uh, actually finding out from the super funds, whether you're, it's, whether it's your super fund or whether it's a group like ICANN or MAPW. Uh, but the disclosure uh, laws that are coming in, uh, I believe at the end of the year, um, requiring all the funds to disclose their holdings should make it easier to find and provide the basis um, for that. So clearly there are lessons to be learned from um, other campaigns, um, a big education role and, you know, and that's in the context of the lack of financial literacy that most Australians have and the complexity of superannuation to them. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, it sounds like an excellent discussion covering many points. Um, okay, I'll, in the interest of time, I'll now ask um, whoever was uh, reporting back for the Pacific Solidarity Group. Um, well, I was nominated as the only male in the group. It wasn't actually true, but <laughs> I said, well, that's fine. I listen. Good at listening. We, we did a great job of hooking up during our sessions. So we got to know each other, which I think had a very positive value. But we also came up with a couple of resolutions. Uh, people came from all over the place and they all had a different sort of interest in the Pacific. And it's pointing to the desire for people to, to know more what's happening from an Australian perspective, but also the, the wonderful work that's been happening for some time in connecting with Pacific communities. Um, the two resolutions that, that we came up with in the time were, um, uh, that I can uh, act as a clearinghouse for organisations in the Pacific uh, who are uh, 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 acting uh, on, on the issues of, of uh, the, the nuclear past and the nuclear future. Um, uh, that um, may be happening already, but that was the resolution. And the second one was equally pertinent, I think, is to seek out the voices of Pacific peoples uh, to find out what is happening on the ground. Um, and um, that was um, my what made, I thought, John Pilger's film so impressive because he went around and talked to people. I think that um, that that um, that was a good uh, uh, position, but I don't I don't think we really got to deep discussions, but that's that's how that's how far we got. 
Um, there is a member of the ICANN board, Dimity Hawkins, who's got very involved in a Pacific, I think it's called the Pacific Truth Project. Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, looking at, or not looking at. Nuclear Truth it, Project. Nuclear yes. Truth Project. Thank you, Tillman. Um, encouraging voices from the Pacific to speak about what's happening and to get involved. And so in some ways that is starting to happen. And I think it's, uh, uh, she's put a lot of work into this as have many other people in the Pacific. And I think that's a project in evolution and something we should encourage to continue. Um, okay, um, education. Who's going to report back on the education group? I offered to do that. Um, we also had a great group, lots of discussion, not enough time. I'm envious that you actually got around to resolutions. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Um, we went around and just, you know, discussed what we do, what angle we, we sort of come from. And the, the big question was how do we coordinate what we do? There was a clear sense in the group that we need to focus heavily on education. And we lamented the fact that, while there used to be a reasonably robust peace education movement in Australia in the 90s and early into the 2000s, that seems to have sort of faded away. Um, and that it was really, really important that we try to find ways of reintroducing peace education. And that would also provide a very good um, arena for discussing nuclear issues, but peace education, you know, you can bring that in right from primary school. It's also really important given the fact that Australian society and politics has become so militarized over the past 20 years. Um, so there's very much a sense of, can we sort of kickstart something like that? Um, people mentioned the model United Nations that's happening in some of the high schools. But there was a, a bit of frustration. How do we get to know what individuals are doing around the place and how can we sort of leverage that and work together to increase um, the, you know, the knowledge, particularly about the dangers of, of nuclear weapons? I think that was it, unless I've missed anything, Daryl. Uh, that was it, well covered, thanks, Mary. Yes, I think San has made a note in the chat that it might be interesting to connect with peace studies departments and universities to find students interested in starting peace education projects. Well, I think certainly Daryl has been working actively in that field for some time. Um, and Marion too, I suspect, amongst others. Okay. Um, the last group to report is the political advocacy group. Brian, would you like to take us away there? Yeah, thanks. Um, so we talked about organizing meetings with um, parliamentarians and councillors, and in particular, we talked about the issue of the limited number of parliamentarians who were involved uh, in the decision to acquire nuclear-powered submarines. And this might be a good uh, issue to raise with uh, parliamentarians and how the decision um, underscores the need for TPNW support and whether the subs are a foot in the door for uh, nuclear weapons programs was discussed earlier. Um, and that we want more than the government's word that's a, that this is a start towards uh, nuclear capabilities and that um, I, can't, I can't be producing materials on the nuclear subs issue um, in this uh, coming uh, period. Um, and then we also talked about the importance of understanding the position of our local member of parliament um, and whether that, you know, whether your member is supportive of the, of the TPMW, that support must be ongoing and there are, might be there might be other issues that you want to raise with them. Um, for example, attending the first meeting uh, states parties next March. And, um, and of course, what will uh, your parliamentarian push for in relation to the nuclear subs issue? Um, and even when your member might be sympathetic or has expressed that they're sympathetic towards um, TPMW, that might not translate into action. And so it's, uh, it's important to find out what their position is and the particular, arg particular arguments that uh, might move their position. So um, I think that might encapsulate what we talked about. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'd add to that, which we didn't discuss in the group, that as well as talking to them about the nuclear subs, encouraging them to, to sign the TPW to prove they're not going to get nuclear weapons, but also to talk to them about sending a delegation to the meeting of states parties next year. The Australian government should be sending a delegation and the more you can, if you, particularly if you've got a 
but I, the Labour Party also should be sending a, a delegation. So whether you've got a Labour or a Liberal member, um, encourage them to think about going to a meeting of states parties. Jem, did you want to add anything to any of those? There's some really good, interesting links in the chat. Sorry, before I digress, there's, a, there's various links um, to peace and nonviolence education in an event in schools um, on the 25th. Um, so, Jem, did you want to take comment further? That was a really good summary, actually. Um, but generally, I know a lot of folks will be interested in this nuclear subs issue. We're seeking advice from a, a bunch of experts on the matter, and we do anticipate in a few weeks having a specific section, um, like a, a Zoom Zoom call, to talk about that specifically. But it's really amazing to see the peace and anti nuclear movement uh, getting organised and active so quickly. So um, I hope everyone's uh, getting involved in that and especially um, that's something that we can do in solidarity with our Pacific neighbours as well is to um, you know prevent uh, nuclear reactors cruising around the Pacific Oceans but I mean generally this is this is the end of band school so maybe we can wrap up and everyone gets an early mark and um, I wish I could give you all medals for being excellent students but it's Zoom unfortunately um, and, you know, this has been a, a five session series that has been running for a few months. Um, so, you know, a huge thank you to everyone who has participated and, and spoken as well. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I also note in the chat that the IPAN um, petition in public statement, have a look in the chat and, and click through to that link if you haven't yet signed that petition, because the more people we can get to sign on the petition, the more influence it will have. And I agree. I'd like to thank Jem for running Band School. She's done a great job throughout. Um, it's been some really, really interesting sessions and some very thoughtful discussion. And I wish we had more time for the discussion in the in the breakout rooms. Um, and I'm astonished that we're four minutes early. <laughs> but I had anyway. Yeah, um, it's it's John, 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 Maggie. Fantastic. Thank you. We we've done we've been doing quite a lot. Um, on the submarines issue, and you've got two of our press releases at the bottom of the chat there. Thank you very much, John. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.